years it was my uh, my very important topics that um, I think I have an obligation to also really bring forward other women in tech uh, and I'm happy to uh, and proud of having a team uh, with you with Eve uh, with others really driving this agenda in digital Europe. Thank you to the consortium who has put the uh, project in, in place and thank you of course to the Norway brand who is really uh, spending uh, you know the, the money in a wise way bringing women to the table of the ICT sector. So let me go a little bit uh, into uh, into why this is important, why this is important to me. I'm turning 50 very, very soon. And looking back at my career, um, you can ask how did a woman actually uh, make the way from, uh, from the bottom to the top of the ICT sector? Well, I think, first of all, it's uh, things that are co coincidental, but it is also the courage to step into a man's world and basically to stick to what you believe in, but also giving place to diversity, not only for women, but also for men who wishes to have a different career or to enhance uh, their potential. To me, uh, the ultimate goal of all this is to have equal opportunity in the ICT sector for women and men, no matter what they choose, part-time, full-time, or top career, um, uh, career uh, top careers. I can tell you that um, when I started in the, in, the, in the ICT sector, I was still studying. Uh, I, uh, I was hired into IBM as a trainee and uh, I ended up of course with a full-time position. And then from there on, it went uh, super quick um, into uh, a career in tech. So why did I make it? First of all, I think I was a little bit of a bumblebee that I was eager to achieve, um, I was creative, I uh, was dedicated to my work, and then I was pretty good at working with all kinds of different people, older than I, men, women, uh, people that uh, normally also people that other people didn't see as talents. I would see their talent and basically uh, make them shine in the role that they have. And I think this is one of the biggest barriers that many of us tend to choose mini-me's people who look like ourselves, people we feel comfortable with because they react like ourselves or they have the same background as us. So this makes it very difficult. If we look at the ICT sector, if we go at the total population of, of employees in the ICT sector, you actually have almost 50% uh, in uh, being women. Then if you go up the ladder, you go to 30, you go to 12, and then you are, end up with four to 6% in top management. At a very early stage, I made it a kind of a, a mission for me to support other women to grow into a management career. And of course, expanding also uh, the number of specialists so they don't only end up in HR position, but really also with a lot of skills, hard skills that are needed to enter you know, great careers and to make the, not least the, the uh, transformative um, creation of new jobs. If we look at this right now, there is an urgency. All the sectors are transforming. So the sectors of health, the sectors of school, uh, education, if we look at uh, transportation, if we look at wholesale, all sectors are transforming. This means that the, the ICT specialist in the future is not gonna be only the coding of a general ERP software system. It will also be the one who is a da data analytic in health, looking at cancer pictures and how you can do algorithms to detect cancer at a very early stage. It will also be the nurse that needs to understand uh, and look at graphs and understand and interpret that in, in the light of the patients that sh she or he are looking at. So there are so many different jobs coming on. And this is exactly why this program is absolutely um, crucial. I wanted to reflect a little bit more on my, my own career and, and some maybe a bit of funny stories from my, from, my own, uh, from my own life. I started basically teaching people how to use a PC. Um, in those days, a PC, we call it a PC driver's license. So just using a PC, just having a PC was something totally new. Today, we take everything for granted, the iPhones, everything we have with us. But at that time, it was really at the limit where you would have an A and a B team, everybody who understood how to use technology and everybody 
who didn't understand how to use technology. Now, today, we are at a different uh, stage. We are, the A team will be the ones that know how to create technologies, or at least understand and utilize technologies into specific functions, and the B team who has no idea and will simply be users of technology. So this is why it's extremely important that we leverage the skills of younger women into the ICT sectors. All sectors will need this. Whether you will be the teacher that needs to teach the children in a new way of technology and in technology use and creation, whether you will be a nurse, a doctor, or potentially someone who's designing cars, clothes, or anything else. So we need to leverage that potential into to the sector. I think that, so if we go a little bit to the why is it that we don't have more women? Well, I can tell you I had some funny experience. And actually, I still have those funny experiences. When you have a male-dominated management, it's very hard to see yourself there. If you go there, you will feel alienated. You will not be able to recognize something that looks like you or somebody to mirror in. And people grow by, by really looking at people and doing the same and learning from them. This is how we learn through life. If there is no one to learn from, it will be very hard to see yourself in that function. This is why it's extremely important for women in high positions, basically to bring ourselves forward as an example. I remember when I had my first VP position, I was traveling, I, uh, I had a Nordic role. Uh, I was expanding, I was getting Germany and Switzerland and other countries uh, under my remit. And um, I landed in, uh, in another Nordic country and um, I was searching for the room to meet. And I was walking back and forward, trying to, you know, locate the room. And there came three men and uh, they asked me, um, would you please make sure that the coffee is served in that meeting room? And I said, uh, yes, of course I will. Uh, could you tell me where the coffee, you know, where the coffee machine is? And they showed me and I went out and I made two pots of coffee and put them at the table. Um, I brought the cups. And they were sitting there. And then I sat down and said, should we start the meeting? I'm your no boss. Uh, so of course they didn't mean any harm. They didn't do this because they wanted to discriminate me. They just took for granted that of course, that small blonde lady could not be their new VP boss. And we have to understand that this will take time. We need to address it in a friendly way when people make, make mistakes like that. Of course I could be offended, but I was not. I just realized that in that time, many years ago now, they did not realize that this was actually being an opportunity or it could even be a fact that a woman had a position like that. This is changing rapidly. I'm determined to address all mistakes like that friendly and with calmness and to make sure that we have a change that where men and women understand that they are equal partners in the, in the, in the work life. Then later, I became the president of the Danish IT Association. We started uh, research on how many women are there actually at the different level of the ICT sector. And exactly, we saw that pyramid going all the way to the top where there was between three and 5% over the six, seven years that we measured. Meaning and that there was hardly any women at that uh, time. If we look at it now, it has actually switched at that time these three to five percent, which is far too little, were actually women in very small companies. Then we had many of the American companies coming out with clear uh, targets and KPIs for their management, putting hard targets, simply that didn't get the bonuses if they didn't have equality in their management team. And all of a sudden today, we see that many of the women in CEO positions are now uh, actually in the bigger companies often in foreign companies, but also in European companies. And the smaller companies is more or less the same. Unfortunately, the overall share is still less than 10%. So we still have a way to go. Anyway, when we look at this, uh, we really need to leverage and inspire other women to go into this sector. It is maybe the most creative sector in the world. We can re-innovate how we look at diagnostics, how we look at close uh, closed design, how we look at driving, energy, consumption, buildings, everything we do in life through the use of technology. 
So we need simply to get more STEM skills. And of that STEM skills, we need to get them into the ICT sector. So a big thank you to all of you here today, but also to the, um, this consortium who's really working with that. Let's look at the results and what we are actually doing. Let's jump uh, one slide ahead, two slides ahead, sorry. And the next one. Um, so we all know that uh, both Digital Europe and the Commission are setting hard targets for uh, digital skills. It is still a national competence, and we still have governments that tells us that it will take eight, year for, eight years for them to change the curricula of a school class. This, we don't have that time, and we really need to push at all levels towards our governments to spend our money, our public tax money, in the right way on education. Our younger generation, all the way from secondary school, needs to learn the creativity of using technologies in different functions. And it actually, what we see is that both teachers and children love to do the coding classes. They invent cool stuff and they really enjoy uh, a creativity that they would not do without. So let's push at all levels. Let's jump to the next slide. So uh, Women for IT, uh, a program that I really admire. Uh, and thank you to Norway for really uh, pushing this forward. You have always been one of the countries that have been courageous enough in putting quotas to how many women are uh, in boards and other things. And this is really what we need. If we, still, if we cannot solve this problem with, uh, with goodwill, we also have to look at hard legislation. This is my view. Uh, it, it's a, I think it's a little bit of failure that we have to do this, but you know, if it doesn't change any other way, I'm into it. If we look now at, uh, at this program, it aims to really take younger women between 19, uh, sorry, 18 and 29 and reskill them into the jobs of the future. And we really also uh, see, uh, uh, we, we conduct a huge outreach to inspire uh, women to go into a future-proof career. It is much too easy to hide away as a woman, as a young woman and say, this is too difficult. I am not good at math. I think, you know, this physics is not for women, but we really need you there. Go there, stand the chance and come into the sector. It is the sector of the future and you need those skills no matter what sector you go into. And it's really, really fun. So let's uh, look at the concrete results that this uh, program has actually made. Let's flip to the next slide. I think it's quite amazing what has been obtained here. So. We have basically uh, informed around uh, 36,000 women. We have uh, 650 almost trained, and we have 419 graduates that have actually found jobs. I think this is amazing, amazing, and we should do much more of this. You know, if you don't get these skills in the educational system, how do we make sure that we actually make people ready to go into a career in tech? And thanks to this program, another 419 people are going into, women are going into this uh, sector, finding jobs, and there is much more to come. A big thank you. Okay, let's flip to the next slide. So, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going into Greta, and Greta, uh, maybe I can just round off by saying, I mean, what you are doing here is really what we need much more of, and what we are doing with you is really what we need much more of. There are so many people out there that are coming out of the educational system with maybe many good skills, but really lacking one of the key skills. I mean, coding and tech is the only universal language of the world. And okay, we speak English, we speak Spanish, we speak different languages, but this is really a fundamental skill that people need to have a future safe job. Also, we know that if we look at service jobs, we know that the ICT jobs have 40% higher value creation than a normal service job, meaning higher, higher salaries, higher value creation in society. So a big thank you. And with that, I will leave the word to you. Thank you so much for your efforts. And I hope that inspired you to take a career in tech. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for, for this keynote. Uh, the stories were really fascinating and thank you for wrapping it all up so nicely. Uh, and without further ado, Greta, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Um, good morning, all, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very interesting conference on women and the digital sector. My name is Greta Hauge, and I work as a program manager at the EA and Norway Grants in Brussels. Today, I will give a brief presentation of the grants and the Fund for Youth Employment and highlight some facts on women and digital. I have to come out straight and say that the digital sector is not my field of expertise. I am an expert in access to the labor market for vulnerable groups and have a long career within adult education and management in the public sector. However, I am 55 years old and I've been part of the digital revolution since I was a teenager. Uh, so you may say I have lived through um, the most important part of digital history. When I was at upper secondary school, my ICT course, the only course that was offered, consisted of coding in BASIC, which doesn't mean anything to you young people, but uh, it was a, a very <laughs> important thing at that time. At university, I wrote my master thesis on my first computer, which was a Mac Plus. And I remember I laughed at my boyfriend because he struggled a lot with all those DOS commands in his on his IBM. So um, this is, you know, uh, the last uh, millennium. Um, I started working in adult education almost 30 years ago, and then um, there was no World Wide Web. We used uh, something called Gopher to communicate with the world. So um, this is, of course, in the Stone Age, but I think maybe some of you veterans have some of the same digital history as me, looking at you, Cecilia and Mara, if you are there. Um, and here we are today on a live online conference. So, well, let me turn to the grants. Um, the EA and NOVA grants are a 2.8 billion euro contribution from Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein to help supporting the development of a more equal Europe, both socially and economically. In addition, the grants aim to strengthen the bilateral relations between the donor countries and the beneficiary countries. And the beneficiary countries are Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Greece, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Portugal, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. That should be 14. The EA and Norway grants consist of 23 program areas uh, within five sectors. So we do a, quite a lot of work in, in many, many different sectors. So um, those sectors are innovation, research, education, and competitiveness. It's social inclusion, youth employment, and poverty reduction. Uh, the environment, energy, climate change, and the low carbon economy. Culture, civil society, good governance, and fundamental rights and freedoms. And justice and home affairs. So a novelty of the current funding period that we are in the middle of are the regional funds. And these are the Fund for Youth Employment and the Fund for Regional Cooperation. These are fundings allocated to transnational projects. And this transnational focus is important because issues like youth employment is a shared challenge among European countries. And we think it can only be solved by working together. In the Fund for Youth Employment, um, Organizations in Ireland, Italy, and Spain are also eligible for funding, and so-called expertise partners from all EU member states and the three donor states can also be involved in the projects. The COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected people already vulnerable on the labor market and in society at large, and we are happy to see the success of our projects in tackling this challenge, and we are proud of your resilience, your creativity, and your motivation when facing the consequences of this awful virus. The Fund for Youth Employment is set up to ensure long-term funding to address complex challenges within youth employment and to develop approaches for the so-called needs, which are people not in employment, education, or training. The project focus on increasing employability and empowerment of groups of young people not that easily reached by the formal systems or the ordinary education and training or labor market pathways. Vulnerable groups and the so-called hard to reach 
are the main priority of this fund. And women uh, are an important target group, and the fund has a clear goal of getting more women into the labor market. Boosting the employment rates among women is important for all European countries in the EU and beyond. According to the labor force survey, women in the EU between 20 and 64 years of age have an employment rate of 66.9%, almost 67%, compared to almost 78% for men. In my home country, Norway, the employment rate for women is 76.5, that is almost 10 percentage points higher than in the EU. But another donor country, Iceland, has an employment rate for women at 79.2%, and that's one of the highest in the world. A former president of the Norwegian parliament uh, was fond of saying that, don't envy us our oil, envy us our women. But obtaining these kind of positive employment rates is hard work and a clear vision on gender equality and a long-term strategy on social inclusion must be applied. While women's access to education and training has improved greatly and several countries see more women students than men in the university corridors, only one third of graduates from STEM subjects are women. We can find the same skewed percentages in the digital tech sector. In Norway, 60% of students in higher education are women, but in ICT subjects, only 22% of students are women. For an important subject like cybersecurity, only 16% of the students are women. From a UK study, we know that only 3% of young girls find a job in the digital sector relevant. But possessing relevant skills and having a decent job is necessary to be able to live independently, to steer one's life and contribute to the development of society. Women's skills development within digitalization and STEM is essential, not only to get prettier numbers, but because gender equality is essential for a democratic Europe. It's important to have gender equality in the digital sector and in STEM, because these sectors steer so much of our everyday lives, and women need to be actors and not just consumers of new technology and solutions. It's essential to secure the move of women from being recipients and objects of technology to being responsible for its future development and use. I'm echoing you here, Cecilia. For more than 30 years, it's been an outspoken goal to get more women into the STEM subjects and jobs, to engage more women into the digital sector, and to bridge the gap between men and women within these fields. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of work to do. What we know is that the digital sector is a growth sector and that there are a lot of vacancies out there. In fact, the sector has trouble finding skilled workers. In this time and age where many people work from home and even more would like to share their work hours between the office or outside and home, digital jobs may become more interesting and attractive. The flexibility of remote work is particularly appealing to people who do double work having the responsibility for a family, and many of these people are women. Apart from the digital sector itself, it's a well-known fact that most jobs now include digital tools and work tasks. About 60% of all jobs could, to a certain extent, be automated if we put to use the technology that's already available. The traditional manual labor market is to a large degree gone, and digital skills are considered basic skills. Today, we are celebrating the success of the Women for IT project. Uh, there are nine countries involved in this project, from the Baltics with Latvia and Lithuania, via the Balkans with Romania, and the Mediterranean with Greece and Malta, to the West with Spain and Ireland. And then we have Belgium and Norway in as expertise partners. This project has many of the qualities we look for in a project under the Fund for Youth Employment. There is outreach, to participants and a special focus on the hard to reach young people. There is quality bespoke training for sustainable jobs based on profiling and testing. There is mentoring and career guidance. There is on the job training to get to know the labor market. And there is networking with important stakeholders and support services to employers. I especially like the profiling tool on digital jobs that's both practical and handy Thousands of women have evaluated their skills within this project. 
this is uh, amazing and, uh, and wonderful to see. When we ask women why they do not study ICT, they often say that they lack knowledge or information on what does this job entail? What, what, what do they mean? What do the people do there? And the profiling tool is therefore a very important information channel for women. Since I'm here, I would also like to take the opportunity to congratulate the, the Spanish partner in this project with their award from, their, uh, from an uh, employer's association of the Spanish digital industry. This is a great achievement and reflects the relevance of the project for important stakeholders like employers. The Fund for Youth Employment has 33 projects in implementation, of which Women for IT is one. Several projects are now at the end of the funding cycle, and I regularly get invited to closing conferences. Last year, it was decided to spend the remaining funds of this youth, Fund for Youth Employment on the most successful projects to ensure sustainability and to extend the good work being done by the project partners. I'm happy that Women for IT was selected by the donors to continue their excellent work on creating opportunities for women in the digital sector. Thanks again for inviting me and I wish you all the success in the world with this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greta. Um, and, you know, we as Women for IT are so proud um, for, you know, having your support throughout the last three years, but also in the coming year. Uh, and we're very excited to grow the project even further and to uh, make some impactful actions across Europe. Um, and uh, talking about that, I would now like to invite um, my colleague Stefanie Janke, who will be moderating today's event about uh, the Women for IT experience for our piloting partners. And during the event, uh, during the panel, the speakers will tell you more about Women for IT, their experience implementing it, uh, the outputs that we have created so far, um, and some tips on how you can take the solutions that we have created um, into replicating the project in your or, uh, your countries or your regions. Without further ado, Stefan, go ahead. Thank you so much, Kasia, and of course to our previous speakers. This was already a really great introductions into, into our day. We still have two and a half hours ahead of us with some fantastic sessions. Uh, Kasia already mentioned, my name is Stefan Janke, and I will be moderating the upcoming panels and conversations uh, that we will be uh, having. Uh, we have heard from, from Cecilia and Greta why the topic is so important and why it is so relevant for our society. So now we want to, of course, look a little bit deeper into the actual Women for IT project. Um, so our first panel is coined The Road to Success. So we have a group of project partners with us today and they will all share with us the process on how Women for IT started and how it got to where it is right now. So we will kind of look through the timeline and start at the very beginning and see how did we succeed and how can we all make sure that we continue this, this path that has been started by Women for IT and of course also give you some insight on how you can get involved. Uh, before we go into the actual uh, project description and kind of look into, into uh, how the project is working, I just want to make sure that you all are aware that we have a Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, the first few questions have already been not only asked, but also answered. So I really encourage you throughout this panel, throughout this next upcoming uh, two and a half hours, don't be shy, ask your questions, uh, interact with the speakers via this Q&A section in Zoom, uh, ask your questions, uh, you know, no matter uh, what question it is, whether it's very particular for the project or if you maybe want to share a story or an experience and want some input, uh, don't be shy, use the Q&A uh, section um, and we'll try to make sure that also at the end of each of the sessions we, we take some time to answer some questions that, that might have not been answered uh, in this, in this uh, Q&A section. All right, so now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the first person that, we'll, we, will, um, that we will talk with uh, about the Women, Women for IT project about, which will be Maria, and Maria is from Greece, and she has started at the very beginning looking at the market demand for ICT specialists. So Maria, if you could briefly introduce yourself, say how you're involved in the Women for IT project, and tell us, how did you start? How did you kick off the Women for IT project? How did you, you know, figure out this market demand? Uh, how did you look at the future? And, and yeah, tell us a little bit about this process. 
Okay, thank you, Stefan. Uh, my name is Maria Gianacuro, and I'm really glad to be here with this group, the group of Women for IT, and also the group that is attending this webinar. Uh, I'm a project manager in a small NGO in Greece, and we got uh, involved in this project from the beginning, from the writing of it, because we realized also the need to promote women in the sector, the rest of the partners. Our task was to conduct the needs analysis. And you can imagine the challenges we were facing when we started in uh, 2017, it was the idea, 2018, it started the project, because we had to first try to find ways to promote women in uh, the ICT sector and the combat uh, inequality, and also to forecast which skills will be in need almost five years after the beginning of the project. Both were very difficult because um, just consider that uh, women, we are trying to promote women in the ICT at least the last couple of decades. And we, although we've seen improvements, we are not there yet. And regarding forecasting, which skills are important, just think uh, what we've been through the last couple of years where uh, planning for the next five months was difficult, let alone uh, five years in, fr in front of us regarding skills in demand. It was like looking in a Rorschach mirror, trying to make sense of the ink plots you see there, uh, the trends. So what we did was uh, first that we extended the, the search in order to uh, come across with the real needs of the target groups and also to approach the target groups because they, they are the ones that know best and they will lead us to solutions that would be more re relevant to them. So we used mainly three approaches, a systemic approach to get information, user engagement to verify this information and repetitive testing, again, to verify and make sure that our suggestions were uh, relevant. Uh, to give you an idea of our systemic approach in uh, finding out investigating factors, uh, imagine for homocentric cycles, from small one to big one. The small one, for all the cycles, we investigate and we, receive, uh, we get information. The central uh, circle is the woman. The young women, we want to promote their needs, their expectations, the barriers they face. We got information for all that. Then the next circle is the companies and the employers, the companies, because we wanted our trainings to be relevant for small companies, for big companies, to improve the recruiting labor market for our uh, beneficiaries, but also the employer, not only the company, because it has been found that employers play a very important role in, of course, operating their companies and guiding their companies to digital transformation, and through that to the need for digital skills. And also, even in personal level, there are studies that have shown that the gender of the employer affects the recruiting strategy, whether you will recruit male or females. I'm not going to tell you which gender is more biased, but I'm going to tell you a solution we realized through researching that if a candidate is producing not only a certificate, I'm a digital, special, um, digital marketing specialist, but also a more detailed account of what the training included, then the information he or she gives is more, is more, and the employer, no matter if it's uh, male or female, can make a more sound decision and uh, overcome some prejudice. If you read the report, you'll see which gender is more up to uh, these uh, biases or not. And then the third circle was the work, the tasks, how this would change because of the automation. And we did that because the way tasks changes, they bring about the need for more skills. For example, if you go from an office in a building, to an, an online office, you need other type of skills to communicate, to monitor work, to appraise work. So you need, for example, soft skills, not only technical skills. 
and we wanted this to be included in the training we would develop. And then the last circle was the external environment. It was the economy, the demographics. It was the sectors that in each country, because remember, we were talking about seven countries. We had seven different national sectors. It was also, we also investigated the supply skills and the demand for skills. And of course, we pinpoint the, um, the paradox. There was unemployment in uh, more countries, but there was also a skill shortages. So we needed with this project to bridge this gap and make our beneficiaries uh, ready for that. And in order to gather information for all these factors, we did an extensive desk and field research. For the desk research, we, we collected and our partners uh, shared more than 20, 20 200 um, policy papers, reports, studies, and then articles, and we went uh, to verify what we came out with what came out from this research with field research we approached the users the girls and the employers to verify the findings and also to make them relevant because we know that it's common knowledge that we don't know what we don't know however we do have a knowledge of what we are lacking and what we would like to see and if you have an option there probably you will choose the option that best fits your needs. So we invited our target groups in focus groups, we interviewed them, we created forums in each national uh, setting. So we had four national forums, we had different uh, focus groups in all countries to come up with solutions. And the solutions that we came about to showed that um, jobs are more complex than we realized and they require an array of skills hard and soft not only hard and we took that into consideration in the training and also there were two overarching themes first that there is a need for a constant updating of the skills so a learning to learn need and also there is um, another need to empower women to enact on the skills they acquire. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned by previous uh, speakers, women have less confidence in their skills and they need a mirror. They need to see other role models in order to follow their steps. So in the training, we made sure that we included job profiles, not only skills, and also empowering women through mentoring and through workshops that would help women to find their ways in the new digital world. But for this, you will be heading in the next presentations. So I'm going to leave you here. And if there are any questions, please, um, we are open to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. You, I think you gave a really great insight into you know, how it all started, the need analysis. Of course, we first need to understand what are the needs before we can then move to the next step. And the next step is then, of course, to dissect these training needs and look at what type of training can be provided. And I would ask Mary uh, from ICS to tell us a little bit more about the process in the project. How did you take these needs analysis and how did you get to the actual training? How did you decide what can we train these young mm -hmm. women with? And yeah, tell us a little bit about this process. And of course, introduce yourself briefly. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Stefan. So Mary Cleary is my name. I'm the Secretary General of the Irish Computer Society, representing the Irish Partner in Women for IT. Our main role was, um, as you mentioned, the development of the training roadmaps and also being involved in the piloting of the actual training. Um, Marie has given a great account of the training needs analysis and all the work that we did in the early days. It's hard to think back that far, but we've been working on this for a long time on this project. And that training needs analysis led us to identify eight profiles, not just sets of skills, but real jobs that women could identify with and see role models in, as Maria also, also said. And um, they were interesting, um, and you can see them there on the screen, so I won't spend time talking about them. You can see exactly what they are. They're very relevant to the real world, to the world that we all are aware of in terms of ICT and the kinds of 
um, uh, tasks and, and roles that, that people would need to do. So we were confident that they were the right roles for this, this project and that they would meet the needs of each country. Um, every country didn't provide training in all of them. In Ireland, for example, we selected four, which we felt were the most suitable to the needs of, of our country and the industry in Ireland. We then had to develop a training plan and a, a, a roadmap that you mentioned really is a training plan. But a roadmap is a very good metaphor because you have to plan a route, you have to know where you're going, you have to know what your starting point is, and you have to know what the milestones are that you're going to um, encounter along the way. So it has to also be easy to navigate. Um, we talked to experts. We didn't just, even though the, um, the, the team um, had many training and development experts uh, on board, we talked to the experts in the industry, the experts in these roles to make sure that what we put together would be a really sound uh, training plan that would prepare the young women for the kind of work that they really would be doing on the ground when they hopefully became employed. And then in terms of finding these young women, we had to make sure that they were suited and that they were had the right aptitude and that they had some basic skills. We, you know, there, it's important in, to get involved in a program like this, that there were some basic, basic IT skills, nothing too significant, but basic enough to enable them to engage with the program. And we also tested their aptitude, and this is all, uh, all took place in the online profiling platform that's been mentioned. And I think the link has been shared as well. So at the start, um, we planned the content. And again, the experts helped us to put that together. And we had to make sure we had the correct focus for the roadmap and for this route. So it wasn't too difficult. We could have to make sure the terrain was navigable by the, the um, participants. Um, it was a, we, these were entry level positions. They're not full high level um, you know, professional roles. They're entry level roles to give these women a, 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 a starting point. The, the first to step on the first rung of the ladder, I think, in terms of developing a professional career. We had 160 hours of training that we could provide for them. And because they were, they were women who were out of the education system, who were out of employment, and uh, we, we, you know, they, they weren't um, involved in, in the industry already, we had to make sure that the learning we provided was in small little bite-sized chunks. And, and, and the modules were uh, self-contained and they could uh, complete them, but each module would be uh, a milestone in its own right. The assessment, uh, likewise, um, had to be suitable and varied. We had to have a mix of continuous assessment and um, uh, final uh, assessment at the end of the module, both formative and summative um, assessment, uh, to give some uh, you know, feeling of success and some motivation and some reinforcement to the participants. Um, a very important part of the training was the variety, uh, some online, some offline, of course, COVID forced us to do more possibly online than, um, uh, than offline. And we also ensured that as well as having professional trainers, the young women all had mentors. There was a mentor assigned to each young woman to keep her motivated, to encourage her to um, give advice and guidance and be that extra support that sometimes these women don't have in their society or in their, their local community. Um, the communication therefore was kept up and we were able to monitor and adapt and um, customize the training to the needs of individual young women because these were individualized uh, roadmaps of course I should have said that also. Um, so the variety of learning approaches, the variety of assessment methods, the reinforcement provided by badges being provided at the end of uh, each module. These were the main aspects of the uh, uh, training roadmaps that we provided for the young women. So I hope that's of some help. I think that's a fantastic summary, Mary. There's a little bit of background noise, but I hope everybody could at least understand the... Oh, okay. The, the, the I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> yes, but I, I think at least I understood everything, so I hope it, it was clear yes. to everyone. So that we, we get the idea that, of course, now there's this training. Also very interesting that every country decided to not necessarily use all these eight job profiles, but also to focus and say, hey, what are really the needs in, in our particular situation, in our particular reality, and also then adapt to this. Um, the next speaker is a speaker that will maybe give us a little bit of insight on how 
a young person then would actually decide which profile would be interesting because if I'm young, I'm maybe not out of education. So I'm, in, I'm one of the, the need, uh, so not in education or training at the moment. And I'm interested in this project. Um, so I would ask Greta to tell us a little bit more, how does a young person then decide which training to take and in which direction uh, can they take? So once again, Greta, if you can briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more on, on how a young person can actually decide which training to take. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Greta. I'm from Lithuania and I'm representing here Baltic Education Technology Institute. I'm deputy head there and also I was involved in this project as a project manager. So yes, the platform, the platform structure and the whole platform itself was one of the most difficult things for us to do. Uh, however, after a long discussion with partners, employers and stakeholders, a lot of reviews of different technical specifications, we reached a common solution, which you can find somewhere in the chat, I guess. So therefore, uh, the platform itself, I bet uh, that you registered there or um, tried to navigate at least saw how it looks like. So the platform is made from two main parts, I, I would say that, which are digital readiness tests and then tests for a digital job profiles or as we call it, profiling tool. Uh, so the first step to take on the platform is digital readiness test, which identifies if you have enough basic basic, I highlight that basic ICT technical skills and knowledge to start any of the trainings. Uh, this test contains of 20 self-evaluation questions. And the first obstacle when creating this test uh, was to decide the barrier which would allow people to take the digital job profiling test. Because if you do not pass the digital readiness test, you're not allowed to go further on. So here we saw that the situation in different countries really differs and digital skills on the of the people are not equal across Europe. So based on that, for some of the countries, the barrier of the digital readiness test to pass it was 80% and for others, 50%. Some of the countries lowered the barrier along the way as saw that 80% to score was too high for the country's group. So if people take the test and scored 80 or 50% depending on the country or more, they can take digital job profile tests uh, to see where they fit the best. So profiling tool, uh, profiling tool tests are a little bit different from the digital readiness one. As first, uh, they're made of questions based not on, the, not on self evaluation as the digital readiness test, but on knowledge, abilities and soft skills as Maria mentioned before. So this part here is very important in our opinion, as usually people forget about the soft skills and rely just on the technical knowledge, which is not always the best way to go when choosing what to do in your life. Uh, what else should be highlighted here is that the profiling tool developed together with the employers and IT professionals, so we can assure that th this reflects the real situation and the profiling tool basically scans you and identifies which digital job profiles you choose most and where you have the most knowledge. Um, what to say more here is that the profiling tool is a recommendational tool. Uh, it allows you just to evaluate yourself and to see where you have least work to put on and where you have to work most. So I don't know if you catch how I said people instead of young girls, which was our touch group, but this is for the reason. So the tests on the platform are freely available for everyone, doesn't matter your country, age or gender. Uh, however, of course, we asked our candidates to take these tests before joining the courses in order to assign them to the courses more easily. So in general, job profiles already selected as the most needed nice tea markets in different countries, which makes more personalized. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. And guarantees that you're learning something which is really on demand and you will find a job in this sphere. In addition, the tests are based not only on technical knowledge, but on attitude, which lowers the dropout levels when training starting or the satisfaction when actual work starts. Uh, on the screen, you can see the some statistics. Um, here you can see how many times different tests were took in all partner countries together. And these numbers are just one of the indicators that this kind of projects are needed 
they're interesting and welcomed in whole Europe, I would say. So please uh, open the platform register there and take the test by yourself and see how it works because uh, I can't explain it better than you will experience that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Greta. I, I think it's it visually we can we can see these different profiles, also some of the numbers, uh, how many people participated in, in which of the, uh, the different profiles. Um, so if I can summarize a little bit, so we, we had the needs analysis, we have the trainings put in place, and now we also give the opportunity to young people to actually identify which is the, the profile that fit best. But as we mentioned already, all the national realities might be slightly different. So what I would like to do next is that I would like to ask some of our partners to share with us their national experience. So having all these tools in place, what did they do in their particular national context to actually get young people to take the test and then to start taking the trainings? And I would like to ask Vita maybe to start. Vita is from Latvia. Vita, if you could briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what was your approach in your national context? Uh, yes, thank you, Stefan. Uh, my name is Vita Vito Lapinja, um, and I represent the, the leading partner of this project, Latvian Information and Communication Technology Association. And um, we have been focused on the involvement uh, of uh, women in ICT for the last years, and it has been a pleasure to implement uh, the Women for IT project in Latvia as well. So um, how did we find an involved uh, young woman? So first of all, we have a saying in Latvian that one man, or in our case, woman, in a field, he's not a warrior. So meaning that you need a support system. And in our case, uh, these were stakeholders with a common goal. And in every country, we made this kind of a support system uh, to work. Uh, uh, so first in Latvia, one of the keys of the success um, was that we established a cooperation with the state employment agency. So having such a countrywide support uh, of the employment uh, agency, ensure that we had the possibility, uh, possibility to directly access our target audience, the young uh, need women. So we signed a memorandum that we have this common goal uh, that we want to, uh, to change uh, young women lives and uh, support young women in finding their path in, in ICT and in digital jobs. So, and based on the memorandum we acted, uh, we provided the training uh, to the consultants of the agency who then uh, later promoted uh, women for IT as one of the, the opportunities for, for their clients to choose from. Uh, and of course, we had also other channels. We used the social media. Uh, we, uh, we used traditional press presence, uh, press releases. Um, and we used also promotion through NGOs. So in Latvia, we're quite lucky. It worked very well because we have uh, passionate NGOs working on this matter. Uh, in Latvia, we have the Tech Girls Initiatives, uh, both in Riga in, and in Liepāja, in other rural, rural territories. But uh, the results of Latvian participants show that uh, out of almost uh, 1,200 participants, who, uh, young women who, who registered and, and took the tests, one third of them got to know about the, the opportunities from the state employment agency, and almost half from social media and friends. And if we look at this number, that almost half of the participants got to know about the courses uh, and the program from social media and from references, um, so this is another thing. Uh, we, uh, we, we made the training as a two-phase process. So in the first phase, we aim to train uh, 40 young women and to see how our approach and tools worked out on a smaller scale. And in the second recruitment, we aimed for a larger audience. We wanted to train 60 girls. And I would uh, definitely want to say that after the first round, uh, we almost did not need uh, any promotion for the second round because of the references and the word of mouth promotion from the first round participants. Uh, so, of course, uh, promotion is needed and it's a good thing, uh, but the product, or in our case, that the training program and the tools, uh, they have to be valuable. They have to be valuable and useful for, for people to apply and to recommend to others to apply. Uh, so we would not be able to do this without the, the well-developed tools my colleagues already talked about. And uh, this is the best feedback we could wish for that the participants, they valued our approach. 
that is so wonderful to hear that actually in the second round, sort of the, the peers themselves had such a positive experience that they just said, hey, you know, to their friends and maybe, you know, to their brothers or sisters or, or others to, you know, take part in this. And that's really great to hear. Um, Augustina, tell us a little bit more about what, how, how was your involvement and, in, in, yeah, tell us more about yourself and, and the, your involvement in the project uh, also on the national level. How did you implement it? Maybe some differences to, to what Lichter did. Hi, hi, Stefan. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for letting us be here. Um, I do have to agree with uh, Vita a lot. Um, first of all, uh, without all these um, tools, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, and the first part is build up your support system. Um, we started by um, designing this uh, dissemination. How are we going to spread um, the program and we are a nonprofit organization. I am representing Plan International here. And we we collaborated with the Spanish employment agencies. So we did it like the, the other side, as Vita said. Uh, we collaborated with women's communication organizations and we mainly approach uh, the national youth uh, guarantee system that is um it's a European program aid, aimed to promoting the integration for young people specifically who are not currently studying or working. Um, of course, we counted uh, with our partner, B Job, who's the organization that provided the training, um, and they also published the program on their website. Um, and their social networks. Um, we posted, uh, of course, uh, on social networks and as uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and so on. Also on um, newspaper and other uh, communication um, um, methods. Um, the, the, the main part after that was like the, the the participants were joining in the in the website and some of them uh, they were taking those tests immediately and um, we saw that uh, some of them had some more difficulties on following up uh, with those steps but right away we were um, contacting them and helping them um, to fill up those those questions or to f figuring out why did they stop uh that process um answering all their possible questions uh, overall we had a total of almost 400 women registered into the platform and out of them 333 completed um the self-reflection digital test um uh, yes we enrolled 160 women into the training courses um and only 100 like 131 of them had a university degree. Um, the rest had different study levels and only um, three of them had only primary education. Um, so we did have a, a variety. Um, the, the main, as I said before, is to choose a good training partner as the job in this case. And we had a very strong dissemination campaign that was very, very, very strong at the beginning and gave us the support at specific moments. Um, what else I should say? The registration and profiling process um, was difficult at some points, but we managed um, to support where it was more, most needed. So yeah, thank you. If you have any questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Augustina. Uh, so we see also there, there, there was maybe also a few more cooperations with sort of official government organizations or organizations that, that are well established, uh, whereas in Latvia, maybe there was more NGOs that were, were involved. Um, let's, so we, we were in the east, now we went to the west, let's go to the south. Um, Charmaine, you, you are from Malta. Tell us what was your experience in Malta? Was there any differences, anything very particular for Malta? Um, share with us your experience and once again, please introduce yourself briefly. Yes, um, I am Charmaine. I Buttigieg from Tech County. And yes, we held the piloting of the Women for IT training in Malta. Um, we started off from preliminary studies which were held and it emerged that women lagged far behind their male counterparts. I mean, they come to pursue a career in ICT. So we, at, 
we tackled these students who were kind of searching for a job and a Thai kind of study, and we encourage them to proceed to towards the ICT sector, which we find which we managed, and we were highly happy with, with those. First, then we we like the LACTA, like the Latvian partners, we established a communication with the state employment agency for Malta because they have a register of the people who are looking for a job, and then they can direct them to the women for IT prof profiling, which proved quite uh, encouraging the number of girls which were taking the, the courses. As for the dissemination of the project, we use all possible media channels that were available. Um, prior to the COVID outbreak, we, held, we attended various activities which were held physical, kind of with, uh, with employment agencies like the small, me small medium chamber enterprise. And we, we, we promoted the, the project there to encourage workers with low level or who wanted to upgrade their ICT skills to encourage them to take Duman for IT courses. However, then as the situation turned on a different angle since we all had to go virtually and we boosted further the social media campaign and we used all possible channels available like Facebook, Twitter and then we, we communicated also with the local councils of, the, of each locality for the island because these local councils they hold courses for for their within their communities and they immediately know the uh, the girls kind of the the sectors which at, which need more training so we we teamed up with the local councils we targeted also non-governmental organizations charitable institutions targeting young mothers and people living in shelters. And we also reached out to young girls within the correctional facility so that they use the time they are detained to come out with something and accredited course which can help them in the future find a good job. So basically we did all, we follow the same path followed by our partners and we try to beef up where there are, there were areas which were kind of uh, lacking or uh, needed more input from our end. Really great, Charmaine. It's, it's also very interesting to hear that you also targeted, which I think is something that, you know, wouldn't have even have come to my mind. But of course, there's women in correctional facilities. So th these are really just some prime examples on, on how to really be inclusive and, and look, you know, ac across or outside of the box, as, as one would say. So, so thanks for, for sharing on, on how you did things in Malta. Now, we have a last speaker that can also share with us. Of course, there's the story of the national context. And um, that's going to be Andrada, but Andrada, I have a slightly different question for you. So we have heard now already, you know, we had the needs analysis in the beginning, we have these trainings, we have heard three great examples on, you know, different parts of Europe, how was the approach to actually get these young women into the training, but now there is, of course, one very important step left, which is that once you have these young women in training, and they have, you know, their certification, what is the next step? Getting them into actual employment. So if you could tell us a little bit more on how did you actually get in touch with employers? How did you work with employers? And why is it so important to work with employers and make them aware of the benefit to, uh, yeah, to employ as a trainee, as an intern? How, how did you approach employers to make them aware of the, the value of women for IT? And of course, to also very concretely get these, these trained young women into, into a job or a traineeship. Hi, Stefan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the question. So um, I'm Andrada Beloya, and I'm a project manager at uh, Educating for an Open Society Foundation in Romania. And first of all, let me start by, by talking a bit about uh, a very important tool that we developed within the project, which is the Women for IT Employment Toolkit. So this is um, 
a practical resource which we developed for both young women that could become digital professionals and for employers in the tech sector that were struggling to fill the job openings in their companies. Uh, we translated the toolkit in seven languages and adapted it to all seven piloting countries together with our partners whom you've listened to before. And uh, the scope of this resource is to support two main objectives. First, to motivate young women to embrace digital careers, and second, to engage employers into the preparation of future employees. So the idea behind it was to be a two-folded toolkit available in the first place for young women aged 18 to 29 years old, uh, the ones falling in the need category, which means not in employment, education, or training, and who want to build up their knowledge on digital jobs and the digital sector and uh, consider this to be an exciting career pathway. Um, the second fold of the toolkit uh, is dedicated to employers looking to enrich their staff recruiting strategy, their pool of ready trained employees, and it is also meant to boost them to want to be part of the change uh, in creating a more consistent ID community within their organization. So within this toolkit, we try to gather as much, you know, useful information as possible. And so you can find in there key principles that give a good understanding of the opportunities, advantages, and challenges ahead for both women and em employers, um, as well as practices and information about the European job market. And more than that, the toolkit provides access to services related to the IT sector, recommendations uh, for organizations and NGOs that offer similar support, uh, testimonials from the Women for IT alumni across all piloting countries, as well as from role models who served as really good success stories and good examples, and last but not least from employers that collaborate with the project. Um, you can also find in the toolkit information such as, you know, tips and tricks in writing a successful CV and applying for digital jobs, uh, ways to engage in a digital path available for young women, and uh, a non-inclusive service for tech employers to recruit, train, and hire new talent. So, in a nutshell, both women looking for advice and support and employers interested in getting involved in, the, in, in this field in creating a wider IT community can basically access the resources available in this toolkit, which my personal opinion is that they can bring a great contribution to the future tech communities around across Europe. Um, this toolkit is not only developed for, for the trainees of the project. Every woman that is in search for a digital career can, can have access to it. Every other employer then that is you know, looking for new opportunities can also browse through it and so on. Uh, trainees, for example, they can revisit the recommendations we offer in it, or they can share it with other young women or people that are interested in this domain and they can just go through it and use the information in there. And um, it's, for example, employers can use it uh, in their future recruiting plans and get access to the tailored uh, training roadmaps that we, we recommend in the toolkit and maybe get involved in similar projects that will rise in the near future. So, um, you know, um, for in the Romanian case, when we wanted to access, um, to have access to employers and to promote a bit uh, the project in order to, you know, to begin to pilot it, we basically did um, similar, um, similar ways like LICTA and PLAN and TechMT presented. Uh, we, we got in touch with employers and asked, um, you know, what's, what, what are their, their main um, needs in their organizations. We, we promoted the, the trainings online via our social media channels and newsletters and meetings with employers and the entire network that we have, you know, in our, in our um, small community. And um, in the end, uh, we managed to, um, to, to pilot uh, four uh, uh, job profiles. And uh, out of 100 trained, we managed to have 70 uh, girls hired, found jobs. Uh, so for us, that was like really good, you know, good number, and we consider it to be a good success. Um, of course, the pandemic, you know, it also um, 
it had a big impact across all countries, all piloting countries. And uh, I would say that maybe one thing that we didn't um, foresee when we first started was of course the, the same impact of the pandemic, but it had um, a bit of lower um, implication from, from employers as we, we mainly thought it would. And maybe there were less internship opportunities for the girls because we thought that would be a really good, you know, beginning to start a digital career after you graduate a training like this. But in the end, as I mentioned before, with all the numbers that we summed up, we managed to just draw the line and call it a success. So from, from, my, from my part, this is my feedback. So thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, Andrade, also to, to give us the insight on, on how these things work. And I hope everybody has seen the link and, and can, you know, follow this employment toolkit. It's a really useful toolkit, uh, very comprehensive. Um, we're, we're almost coming to a close and we will soon hear, of course, firsthand also from the experiences. But we, before we close, I have one question and I don't know, maybe uh, Vita, maybe you can answer this question. So how, how do people get involved? So I'm participating in this conference now. Um, I've heard about, you know, everything from the beginning to, you know, the, the implementation. Um, of course, we'll hear more, but Vita, can you tell us, so if I'm an employer, if I'm a young woman, wh where do I start? How do I get involved? Uh, yes. So currently, uh, the project has been piloted in the in the project partner countries, uh, as you have already heard. Uh, but the materials all are uh, are uh, developed in, in English and are publicly available and uh, free of charge, so everyone can use it them. Uh, as you might hear, hear uh, that the, the project will uh, happen for an additional uh, period of time. So for the next period, we have planned uh, also additional um, webinars or conferences, how many you call them, uh, to 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 other countries uh, to, uh, to explain our experience and how one can replicate also the, the project uh, approach uh, to their country. So I would suggest to, to follow us also on social media or to, uh, to, to contact us uh, directly uh, to get to know how they uh, could in uh, get involved if they are not from the, the project uh, partner countries. Uh, if you're from the project uh, partner countries, of course, uh, then you have to contact the, the respective partner from from your country and uh, see uh, how can you get involved in the upcoming periods. Fantastic, really good. So so this is how to get involved in case you you also want to get involved. Now there has been a lot of information. I think it's a good time to take a little breather, digest some of these information before we go to the second part of the conference. So I suggest that we take a little break. Everybody can get up, stretch yourself a little bit, maybe get a new beverage, a new coffee, tea, water. Um, and we will be coming back here in around 10 minutes. So at 11.30 Brussels time, we will be meeting back here. And then we will hear firsthand some of the experiences of some of the young ladies that have actually gone through this uh, process and had the chance to uh, yeah, go through the training. So for 10 minutes, we'll, we'll have a little break. Um, as I said, stand up, stretch yourself, and we'll be convening back in 10 minutes. And thanks to all the panelists for, for these wonderful insights.
All right, so it is 11.30. I think we can slowly get started. I see already both Diana and Virginia, you're both here. Letizia is also there, fantastic. Hi. Hello, hello. Ah, and Taya Hi, all. also there. Everyone is here, fantastic. Perfectly in time. Okay, we'll give it a few more minutes for people to sit down. Okay, I would suggest we slowly get started again. Um, as I already said before the coffee break, now we have sort of the first hand experience. So there's a, there's no uh, no filter now, no no project partner saying how they have been working on the project, but we actually do have the first hand experience um, from four young ladies who have undergone the training that have gone through the or utilized the Women for IT project um, to do the training. And uh, yeah, we will hear the stories from them now. So maybe we can start off with uh, Virginia. Virginia is from Spain. Um, Virginia, why don't you tell us just very briefly, a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved in Women for IT um, and kind of run us through the process of uh, how you experience the Women for IT project? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak in this uh, event. I feel very honored. And I want to thank you all who supported Women for IT in Spain um, because you, you had uh, done a very great job with all of us, uh, me and the rest of the girls who attended this course. So yes, I'm Virginia, I'm from Spain, I have uh, 30 years old and I studied the uh, digital media specialist course because my background is social and environmental enterprises and marketing and communications. So I just wanted to, to go more deeply into this subject and I found out about this course because I'm involved in other, in other groups of social entrepreneurs. So they forwarded me this opportunity and I just applied and it was, it was fantastic. Um, I also want to thank a lot my teacher, Monica Arana, the teacher of this course, because she encouraged us so much to believe in ourselves as women, as professional, and um, yeah, just, just making our, our own path through, through this career. So thank you very much if she is here, I don't know. Um, and yes, uh, after finishing this course one year ago, it has been very challenging for me because I'm in this process of finding out who am I as a professional and also how can I fit in in the market of the jobs, you know, which is some, sometimes it's a bit challenging. But I had great opportunities. I work for small businesses who are making an impact and run by women. So I feel super honored to, to helping them to, to take their projects to the digital world. As I said before, I'm a copywriter and also I, so I, I'm a specialist in creating content as well for uh, social media platforms and companies. At the moment, I'm working for a medium company based here in Barcelona where I, where I live now. Uh, so I'm a customer care specialist, but I've recently been promoted to be the manager of the department of creating content for the blog and the YouTube channel. So I'm really, really happy uh, for this opportunity. And I don't know, I just feel that I want to thank you all for, for giving us the opportunity. You know, Women for IT has been great. Uh, they are a group of women and, well, people who... Mm who give us a lot of opportunities of speaking with other women who are already working in the IT sector and having like more a clear picture of how we can actually access to it. So I don't know, it has been great. They also give me a, a coach, a private coach where I can speak to, especially in a tough time where I was finding a job that it can be very solitary path. So I don't know, um, please, uh, for all the people who is supporting this kind of projects, keep doing that because you're actually changing people's life, real people's life. And also for the girls who are thinking of maybe enrolling these courses, just do it because it can change yours. 
So that's what I all have all, all can I say for you guys. <laughs> thank, thank you very you much. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah this is such a wonderful and, and positive testimonial. I, I yeah, they, I mean it's it speaks for itself. Thank you so much. Let's maybe hear from the other ones as well. Diana, you're you're from Romania. So you decided to go for the web development traineeship. Diana, tell us a little bit about your story. <laughs> Uh, hello again. Uh, thank you for the, this opportunity to, to speak in front of you. So my name is Diana Oladi. I'm uh, from uh, Timisoara, Romania. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in uh, international relations and uh, European studies. Uh, and uh, I uh, finished uh, the course for development uh, at this program. And uh, now I am a general developer at uh, Victory Square Partners. Um, and why I decided to enroll in uh, this program? Uh, because at first uh, I started to study on my own, and uh, after a while I uh, felt uh, that uh, I uh, was struggling, and uh, I thought that I needed uh, guidance uh, in uh, this uh, direction. So uh, I started uh, to consider to pay for courses, but uh, at the time I was unemployed and uh, I uh, didn't have uh, the funds uh, to pay such a course. So I was uh, lucky enough to find out that uh, one variety was uh, looking for people like me and uh, I didn't think about it and uh, I uh, uh, enrolled in this uh, course. And... Uh, I uh, chose the, this uh, profile from then uh, because uh, I consider myself uh, the uh, very creative person and uh, I uh, really like uh, to see what is change uh, in the front uh, and side of things uh, when uh, I work on my code. And uh, yeah, it, it was a very beautiful uh, experience. Uh, uh, this program, I don't know, it was uh, very nice uh, to work with all the girls and uh, I would uh, repeat it uh, at any time. Um, and I learned a lot, a lot, and also it uh, really gave me courage, confidence uh, that uh, I can pursue my dreams and uh, uh, become a web developer. So yeah, that's a short uh, uh, story about myself and uh, habits and how I was uh, Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Diana. And uh, once again, great to hear that sort of there's this encouraging words also for others to get involved. So I, I can really see that uh, that the impact was there. Uh, and, and it's great to hear that you actually also found a job afterwards uh, after this traineeship. Now let's move on to Letizia. Letizia, you once again, a different path, digital media specialist. Um, uh, tell us, Letizia, a bit about your story. How did you get involved? And describe a bit your experience with the Women for IT project. Hi, thanks, Stefan. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. I'm really honored to represent Ireland and also Brazil, that it's my hometown. I am 25 years old. I'm from Brazil. I currently live in Dublin. I have worked with digital marketing since the university, so it's been kind of six years from now. I've done the digital marketing executive course and now I work at a non-profit organization here in Ireland it's called Spawn Out I'm really happy to be there and the course itself uh, back then I had recently uh, moved to Ireland and it was a really tough time I wasn't employed and it, we had a really restrict lockdown and for me like it was really good to be part of the group. Uh, it was uh, an important group in, the, of, in my area. So it helped me to understand more about uh, the market here in Europe and all the technical terms that I use in my field. So it was very important to upskill the knowledge that I had and important to learn more about the market as well. To update myself was really nice and it was a great network as well. It was really, really good to be part of the, the course. Are you still in touch with, with others that you did the course with, Letizia? Yeah, yeah. I still have a friend that we talked about, talk like every week, every we still get in touch. So it's really nice. And also Lu Lucia was one of my mentors in the course. She's really, I know she's here. So hi, Lucia, miss you. <laughs> she's really nice as well. 
great. Thank you so much for, for sharing your experience, Letizia, as well. Um, and last but most definitely not least, we have Tayara, also in Ireland, I think. You're, you're still in Ireland. Tayara, tell us a little bit about your story. Yes. Hi, everybody. So I'm Tayara. And likewise, Letizia, I'm originally from Brazil, where I was born and raised. Uh, and nowadays, I'm living in Ireland, in Dublin, Ireland. So a bit about my background, uh, I, I, I'm a former lawyer, so I studied law in Brazil and I worked as a lawyer and when I moved to Dublin to learn English, I decided to change my career and I was studying a bit of IT by my own and then I came across the Women for IT project that was, I thought that could be the perfect uh, kickstart for this career and it was. So I choose the data analyst profile on that time. Uh, but nowadays, because I was studying data with uh, women for IT, I was a bit concerned about the security of the data. And then after this project, I was studying by my own, uh, cybersecurity and this kind of stuff. And currently I've been working with a cybersecurity company, specifically with a network, uh, monitoring that's a bit about me wonderful thank and you so I'd much like... uh... yeah go oh, sorry. ahead sorry. Uh, no i'd like to support virginia's words and saying thank you to everybody for this project if i can maybe ask all four of you but we do it one by one virginia what was sort of the biggest learning outcome that you had from from the women for it project so once you participated if you kind of reflect what was the, the biggest learning outcome that you have from from all of the the process you went through well the biggest learning would be for me that a woman we do have a lot of power if we believe in ourselves that we have uh, just the mindset, just the attitude, just to don't let ourselves down for other people's opinions about women in the IT. Because as, as for my personal background, uh, I can notice that it has been a very big difference be between women and men raised in technology. So for us to kind of like close that gap is up to us and how we believe that we can actually change that, you know. So as I said before, Monica, my teacher, she was great at giving us that power, that like believing and attitude towards finding a job, finding your career. I actually have a podcast thank of her. So she believes so much in my communications skills and the stories they want to share that I, I started the podcast within this time. Um, so yeah, I would say that just keep believing in yourself, keep fighting and just create your own happy life <laughs> through technology. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Same question to you, Diana. What, uh, what was your main learning outcome? Was it similar to Virginia? Uh, I really support what uh, Virginia said, uh, but also for me, uh, I think uh, besides uh, the IT knowledge that uh, I learned here, I uh, learned to, to be more confident and have the courage to keep pursuing my dreams and uh, never give up, so that's, uh, that was the biggest uh, thing for me. Great. Letizia, what about you? What was what was your main outcome from, from this project, your main learning outcome? Yeah, besides what they told, uh, for me, it was really good because uh, the project itself, uh, it breaks a lot of barriers. So uh, it was really nice for me to work in my area and to develop my skills. So um, I wasn't dominating the language because I speak in Portuguese. So for me, it was really good to get in touch with English and the know-hows of the, the the area itself and it was really good to build the confidence of myself as well um i think yeah this and update myself as well was really important to me back then and those were the big learnings for the course. great thank you so much tayara how about yourself so i was asked this question once when i finished the course and my answer is the same like the, the outcome is beyond the technical skills. Like Virginia said, again, it's beyond that. It's about empowerment. So that is something that I would highlight. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I hear pretty much from all four of you that it's not only about the technical skills, which of course are very much at the center of whatever path or profile one chooses, but very much about empowerment and also just gaining the confidence to, to work in the sector that maybe is something that before wasn't there. Maybe this kind of leads me to another question and Tayara, since we're already talking, what, what was one of the big challenges while you were going through the process? Was there any challenge in, and how did you overcome these challenges? So uh, the challenge is because for me, everything was new. I come from a completely different background, but I would say that when, since you start to, to get comfortable, uh, be uncomfortable, you can move on and keep studying, keep going. And that's that's what I would say. Okay, very good. Diana, how about you? Did you have any challenges throughout the process? Anything you had to overcome? Uh, yes, uh, also I had a different background. Uh, I didn't have a technological, a technological background uh, in this area of activity and uh, it was very challenging, uh, but with the help of my mentor, I uh, really overcome it and uh, yeah, um, it was great. Fantastic. Letizia, how about yourself? Did you have any challenges? Anything oh. you had to overcome throughout the process? What yeah, for me, during the, the process? yeah, sorry, for me, the biggest challenge, to be honest, was the English. So the language for me was really tough at, at the time because I was like, it's been like, was like any uh, month that I came uh, to Ireland. So it was really tough for me because sometimes I didn't understand and, but it was really good because I was really good for my confidence and all the sessions that we had, the classes was really, really nice. Thanks, I'm actually, Virginia. I'm actually wondering if it has been highlighted by our project partners, but of course the trainings are also happening in the local languages, so it's not all in English, of course, but depending on which country you're in, the courses and the, the trainings are yeah. also conducted in the, in the local language. Yeah, but it was perfect for me because I wanted to get in touch with the market, get in touch with people, and because of the lockdown, was every, uh, still is everything online now that we're doing right now. So it was really good for me at the time. Really, really good. Yeah. And Virginia, how about yourself? You, you're from Spain. I'm assuming your training was mostly in Spanish as well? Yeah, it was in Spanish. Yeah. Did you have any other challenges or anything that you, you found difficult or you had to overcome throughout the process? During the training? Throughout the training, maybe even before when you, when you had to take the decision to actually take the mm. course or the training? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, uh, I am still in the moment where I'm finding myself in the career path of being a professional. So it was a, a big decision to take this course, but it was actually a really nice decision. And the challenge was, was after when I finished, how to apply all what I learned to the, to the world and how can I actually made my purpose which is helping people so how can i do it and actually being happy helping those people so i'm still in the process i'm learning so much about myself but yes this is challenging but also exciting so yeah that's it <laughs> wonderful how about the others do you have any future plans what does your future look like is everybody still dedicated to to work in the it sector how about the others i'll just open the floor and whoever feels confident can just Share, share the future plans and, and maybe how Women for IT changed your future plans. Oh, for sure, for me, continue, keep studying, studying further. And I have a lot of specific topics that I'd like to, to get more knowledge in. So keep studying, that's my plan and continue. Yeah, I think that's it. We just can't stop right now. Uh, it was really good, the course for me at least. And I know that was for all of the other girls as well. And we are now representing all the other women that uh, was with the course with us. So it's really good because it, it for me, it was a great start. And I don't think like we're going to stop right now. And as Virginia said, we're really powerful. And this is us, like we won't stop right now. Yeah, I do believe the same. Uh, we shouldn't stop now. I mean, we are just in the beginning of our path careers. Like for myself, sometimes I've been quite 
uh, like I want to rush into my success and my achievements, but within this course as well, I just believe that everything is changing so quickly and you, you just have to adapt to this world constantly. So that also became, give me like a, a, a feeling of everything is new constantly and I'm new constantly. So I don't know, I like that part, that positive part of the, of the changing world that we are living in now. Um, and in the future, yes, for sure, I will, I will love to keep um, like staying in this technology sector. Maybe in, also as a professor as well, I love communicating and helping others. So maybe I will do that in the future, let's see. You can become a trainer and facilitator for the future women for IT projects. I would love so. Ladies, we are unfortunately running out of time, but I just want to say really, really thank you for, for joining us because I think hearing about the projects from the project partners is really good to understand the theory and the thought process behind, but having these four testimonials from you and, and really hearing the, the actual stories, the, the human stories behind such a project, which sometimes seems very administrative maybe, uh, I, I think it, it really encourages everyone to, to continue working on this field and, and also uh, it highlights the importance of, of a project like Women for IT. So thank you everyone for, for joining us, for sharing your insights and, and being willing to, to uh, speak in front of such a big crowd, even though it's online. Um, and uh, yeah, good luck with all your future ca careers, whether they are in IT, which of course I think we're all hoping or not. Uh, we wish you all the best and, and hope that you, you have all the great success in your future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. All right. It's time to move on. We have a very special guest with us. So I'm rushing a little bit because I know that she has an incredibly busy agenda. And I'm so happy that she actually managed to make some time for us today. Um, it is uh, Themis Christofidou. I hope I said this way correct. She's the Director General at the DG, EAC, uh, uh, DG Education Youth Sport uh, Culture uh, at the European Commission and she will tell us a little bit more about the EU strategy. Why is it so important um, to not only work on digital but also get young women involved in digital, uh, making sure that the, the digital sector is open, inclusive and um, yeah, Themis, I think I will give the word right to you. You, you are already here waiting to, to speak and uh, share with us what is the European Commission doing? What is the, the, the big outlook, the big bird's eye view on, uh, on uh, yeah, the, the digital agenda from, from the European Union's uh, side? Thank you very much. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, as I connected a couple of minutes earlier, I had the, the privilege to uh, follow some of the inspiring um, interventions of uh, the, the team that has participated in projects. So I, I feel it was a good idea to have connected a few minutes earlier. Uh, of course, this topic is, um, is a very important one. And it's also one that is very close to my heart, both in terms of my profession, but also personally. And Women for IT is an impressive initiative that tackles a crucial issue in today's world the persisting underrepresentation of women in technology studies and careers. Now, this continues to be a mystery to me because I went to study engineering 40 years ago. And uh, at the time, you didn't have many women studying engineering. And I was being told by family and friends, why don't you choose something else? Something more female, huh? something more girly. But that four decades later, we're still discussing this it beats me. Uh, this is uh, something that we, we need to tackle and, and um, urgently. So your, your projects, your funding, your activities don't only increase women's employability, but they also boost their confidence and empower them. So I want to especially commend your effort to support young women who are typically harder to reach, such as those not in employment, not in education or training. The times we live in pose an additional challenge. Studies show that the pandemic had a more negative impact on women across Europe than on men. And we need to keep this also in mind as we go ahead. We, we must make sure girls and women have the skills and the means to be part of Europe's recovery, as well as the green and digital transitions. 
This approach also makes complete sense from the perspective of economic growth and employment, obviously. Data shows that closing the gender gap by 2050 could lead to an improvement in our GDP by 820 billion euros, while total EU employment would rise by over a million people. Needless to say, it would also make the world a better place and a more inclusive place. Indeed, with increasing connectivity, vibrant technological solutions, and more digital work opportunities than ever, today's girls could be tomorrow's leading engineers, data scientists, and IT architects. Yet, the gender digital divide, limited career prospects, and harmful stereotypes and gender norms continue to hold girls back. How do we know this? Well, this is how. According to the most recent data, only 35% of graduates in STEM fields in the EU were women. In ICT studies, this figure falls way under 30%. Labor market numbers are just, are just as low, especially in the tech sector, with only two in 10 ICT speci specialists being women. And finally, women only comprise 34% of self-employed people and 30% of startup entrepreneurs in Europe. Now, none of these are new or surprising, and there's no rocket science behind how we need to tackle this. We need to start with education and training. With our digital education action plan, we do exactly that. We target both schools and higher education. Let me give you three concrete examples among the many actions of the plan. First, at school level, the action plan includes the Girls Go Circular initiative, an online learning program for teenage girls focused on building their digital and entrepreneurship skill sets. Girls learn to tackle concrete challenges related to the circular economy, such as metals, plastics, sustainable fashion, or electronic devices. Over 7,600 girls from eight countries have already completed the learning program last year. And this year, we will reach another 10,000 girls in 10 countries. And by 2027, we want to reach 40,000. Second, for higher education, the action plan will support the development of new programs for engineering and ICT, funded by our favorite program, Erasmus+. Plus. These programs will be based on the STEAM approach to make them more attractive for girls and women. In addition, just two days ago, the European Commission adopted a new European strategy for universities. Among other goals, this strategy highla highlights the role universities play in equipping young people, including girls and women, with advanced digital skills. And third, going beyond school and higher education level. A brand new three-year initiative is kicking off just this month. This is the development of a learning environment in the form of so-called esteem fests. Festivals for girls and women on entrepreneurship, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. The esteem fests will be safe learning places for girls and women of all ages to practice and develop their digital and entrepreneurial competences and to build their confidence and creativity. Topics include building mini enterprises, acquiring financial literacy, learning coding and robotics, and designing digital tools. Over the next three years, five girls and five women esteem fests will be organized each involving at least three member states and at least 200 participants finally and more across the board we are also investing in issues such as strengthening data and evidence collection to better understand what impact gender can have on learning outcomes promoting role models to fight the persisting gender stereotypes putting the work and success of women in the public spotlight, and funding, coaching, mentoring, and training women who have founded and now lead deep tech startups. All these examples come alongside many other actions, both under the Digital Education Action Plan and in many other policy areas. 
But we also know that individual actions, awareness raising and small scale funding are not enough on their own. What we need is first of all, for all actors to work together, public authorities, education institutions, industry, as well as civil society. And Women for IT are a great ex example of this, as it brings together partners from various sectors spanning different European countries. We also need to reinforce public-private partnerships and scale up and expand successful initiatives. And finally, we need to promote gender mainstreaming in education and labor market policies. For example, to be effective, the initiatives dedicated to attracting girls and women to STEM education should be accompanied by other policy measures, including equality training for teachers or eliminating gender stereotypes for, from school textbooks. If I sum it all up, we can do it, but only if we're all together. And today's event is an important step in that direction. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to actually address our participants today and uh, also giving such a really voluminous and, and yet concise overview of all the initiatives that, that are done on European level, which is, I think, very encouraging to see that it's not something that is, uh, you know, just being done by a few, but it's really done top, from the top. There's a willingness to, to work towards this. Uh, and I, I think connecting the, the four ladies that went through the, the Women for IT project and hearing now sort of the, the top European level, I, I think this is a, a really great connection. So thank you so much to, to Them, uh, Themis for, for joining us and, and having uh, the time to, to uh, show us all these information. It was thank a pleasure. So thank you too. And we know that you have to run again, so have a, a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, thank you. So all right, colleagues. So now we have uh, the last panel of the day and we have three speakers with us uh, which will be giving us a little bit of an insight on how to work towards bridging the gender gap in tech but really looking at uh, a different point of view so not from the actual participants or from the the project leaders but also from sort of an external view so we we have with us Evita, Daniela and Johanna um, let's see if we're all there. Yes, I see all of you on the screen. Wonderful. I have to say that the tech works perfectly today. Everybody is spot on with, with the technology. I think after almost two years of Zoom meetings, uh, I think we're all, we're all uh, very well equipped. So maybe let me start with Evita. If you could introduce yourself, you're from the Latvian State Employment Agency. Tell us a little bit about your involvement um, as a state employment agency. How have you been working with Women for IT and why was it so important for you to be involved? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting uh, me or State Employment Agency of Latvia to participate in this uh, very important uh, uh, discussion. Um, uh, yes, uh, we are, uh, we find that this um, public-private partnership in uh, that such kind of projects are very, uh, not only useful, but uh, very productive and uh, uh, we uh, we work very closely together for uh, our uh, association uh, communication and IT LICTA. And uh, our main task was to promote this project Women for IT and offer it uh, to the, the, uh, for our clients, young uh, girls, young women to participate in, in this uh, project. And it, that was uh, such a success for me. And uh, we involved uh, more than 100 young uh, girls, uh, which was uh, registered as unemployed in that uh, moment in, in this, uh, in this uh, learning program and, and project. And, and it, uh, I think it was very successful because um, mostly all of them now are employed in IT companies. And uh, yeah. And I think that uh, speaks a lot about the successful um, of, of this project in, 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 in Latvia. And uh, maybe a little bit about that uh, we learned after this project that uh, 
and we work together with uh, with the private sector. It's very, uh, it's more possibility for innovation. And we um, after the project, we use the tests for our clients and uh, access their uh, digital skills and the development of these skills. How they increase it in, in after the uh, this learning. And uh, we have new ideas for new cooperation, cooperation initiatives, um, and uh, it uh, it's very hopeful for public awareness raising that when we work together, public sector with private sector, it, it's it's uh, very very good for for public awareness raising. And uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of benefits for our clients, and uh, and uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and we can uh, find out the real needs for our clients as well as for employers and uh, and this uh, find this the best um, uh, solving ways how can I say to 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 solve the, solve out this uh, this uh, issues and. Um, Yes, and it's more uh, more open and, and agile for for uh, our our agency and uh, work uh, done together multiplies the outcomes and brings in uh, new cooperation partners and yeah and that's we that's we wants to 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 uh, do it again and and we are looking forward for new initiatives uh, how can we how can we work together with uh, with private uh, private companies and par partners oh, this is really great to hear it was actually one of my follow up questions i wanted to ask because of course this this cooperation between sort of the private sector and a state agency, and in your case, a state employment agency, we would call this the, the so-called private public partnership. Um, so I, I'm curious, is that something that is quite common for, for example, a, a public agency in Latvia to do? Um, what was your experience working with the private sector? And I mean, you sort of hinted already that it's something you want to do more. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Is that something that you, you're planning to do more only for the employment field or particularly for women? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? We, we, we look uh, more broader for this corporation and we, uh, and, um, we look that we go from corporation to real partnerships to 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 join responsibility and uh, liability and uh, not only for women we are we are open for uh, for uh, for uh, other projects as well but but yeah we are uh, we are on the on the on the way or on the work with uh, uh, to, to, to do the next step for, for women and, uh, and continues this project as well, but, but also for, for, for um, other target groups as well. And, uh, and it's not only in employment, but, but we as an employment agency, we, we <laughs> mainly look forward for, for training, training partnerships and, and uh, some, uh, some kind of cooperation in, uh, in, in employment uh, field and issues, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Evita. Um, wh where do you see the, the potential of a project like Women for IT? So getting young women involved in the IT sector, do, where do you see the potential looking, of course, particularly in, in, our, in your case at, at Latvia? Uh, yeah, uh, before we, we, we start to start this project, we are making not, not, not really research, but we look in our statistics and, and we find out that uh, more uh, uh, women than men are, uh, are mentioned that they are interested in IT, IT sector, IT employment uh, possibilities, as well as uh, training programs. And, uh, and you know, we have, as, as whole Europe and, uh, and whole world, we have big shortage in ICT sector for employees. And, uh, and that is the really good way to, to bring the new employees to, to this sector and uh, and you know I, I don't know it's uh, in only Latvia and uh, maybe it's it not issue but in Latvia but uh, you know Latvian women are more um, 
uh, interested in or more uh, motivated uh, for the news uh, or more brave maybe to, to do something new and different uh, as, uh, as they uh, as they do before and what we what we uh, find out after the program the, the the girls said that it was very very good for them that uh, all of them are new in this uh, in this field and uh, they um, support it, uh, each other to to don't give up try more and you 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 will good you will be good in this and and so and they say it's it's very very good for them and uh, and yeah and maybe it is it is the point of success story that uh, they all are uh, in the same position when they start and and this uh, they build some kind of support the team or metaphor for 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 themselves as well yeah yeah, yeah, and I, it's I think something that also the the ladies earlier mentioned that actually went through the training that they have built this personal network as well, yeah. which is of course uh, really important as well when when you want to be successful in in the field. Um, thank you so much, Evita, for yeah. giving us a perspective from the employment agency. You will stay with us. We might come back to you, but I would like to switch to our next speech, uh, speaker, who is Daniela. Kuma, Kuma, I apologize if I'm slaughtering your last name. You can probably say it yourself. Uh, but Daniela, you are, as far as I understand, an HR manager at a private company. So you really are in the in the situation that you might have some shortage in specialists. You have some shortage in actual stuff that you need at your company. What recruitment strategies did you have or did you employ before? And, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you think a project like Women for IT can help you as a private enterprise uh, to recruit more talent into your pool of, of stuff. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with so many great and powerful women and also with you. <laughs> you are a great host. Um, so um working with uh, victory square partners uh since we are a really young company in the romanian market we have three years uh since we've been um founded uh we realized that we need to be really open-minded while while directing our resources to recruitment and what does it mean this openness first of all we um had a few programs like internships and summer practice where we took young people into our um, projects and company and we offered them mentorship and supported them into actually evolving inside the company and growing up um we are pretty much open and diverse um, regarding recruitment and while uh, focusing on our recruitment strategy i think it's really important to emphasize that you are building a great place to work and that you are building a place where people can be themselves and they are supported no matter what is their gender so um, in our opinion um, we pretty much advertise and we try to represent also women in our social media posts. We are really happy to showcase uh, successful stories like Diana in our case. We were so happy to be a, a little part of her uh, journey and let's say a stop for now in her journey. And of course, we wanted to showcase that. And when uh, I when I heard about this project, uh, Women in IT, and uh, we realized that Diana was a graduate and she was uh, the full package of uh, like both, um, I don't know, energy, courage, drive, uh, also uh, continuously learning and trying to acquire knowledge. Um, for us, it was, uh, it was a no brainer that we want to be a part uh, and to support this kind of project. And for as long uh, as I will be with Victory Square, and I'm pretty sure even though I, after I won't be there anymore, I'm pretty sure we'll stick around and be uh, supporting this project further on. 
Oh, that is so great to hear. Also to, to hear from the employer side that there's such positivity. I'm actually curious because, of course, the Women for IT project is particularly looking at uh, young women or young girls that are not in training or education. So now from the ladies that we heard earlier, some of them had some higher education degree, but others maybe don't. C could you share with us what is your view on you know, if you want to become an IT specialist, is it necessary to go through higher education or is there a possibility also to kind of to get trained in different ways, for example, through Women for IT? Can you share just your, your point of view on, on, on the education basis, the level of education that would be required, for example, to get a job in, in your company? Sure. Uh, just let me start with a, a short story. So when I was in the fifth, in fifth grade, I was really good at math, but also in creative writing. So like uh, girly stuff, um, uh, creative essays and so on. And uh, I changed my math teacher and the new math teacher told me that you cannot do both. You cannot do math and also be creative. And then uh, since that day, I only, I started to uh, have only C's as math, for example, and A's in uh, creative writing and so on. And then, and then this conversation and the public education and the teacher that uh, were a big part of my life as a forming uh, young lady, uh, wired me in such a weird situation where I then followed my career uh, based on um, things that people told me I'm good at. So now I'm in HR. Uh, of course, I work in the IT sector, but I am like more people oriented and doing, let's say more uh, easy weight stuff. So I'm not actually coding or I'm not actually um, a developer or a cybersecurity specialist and so on. So education in my case wired me wrong in a way. Uh, what we're trying to do, and also what uh, the current in IT industry needs to uh, keep on doing and actually do it more, is try to look past the education, like the, the formal education, and try to uh, have people for the first for the first interview, even though if they even though they have no actually production experience, but they have a course or they have some projects on Upwork, or uh, I don't know, they are freelancing for a year and they're studying by themselves. For us in uh, at Victory Square Partners, we have a few really good uh, success stories with people that after, I don't know, 10 years in one field, they decided that they want to switch their career and they started to learn by themselves, or uh, they were a part of, uh, uh, alternative education course like IT school in Timisoara or a program like Women for IT where people are actually learning in such a short uh, period of, of time more than you can actually learn in eight years of public school in the traditional environment in where the teachers maybe are not not all of them are uh, you know, open-minded and really into uh, forming young professionals. So in our case, we are highly, highly focused on drive and or uh, extracurricular activities. And yeah, I, ho I hope I answered to your question. <laughs> Yeah, I, think I got you, to be carried away. <laughs> no, I think you very much did also from your, your personal story that, of course, uh, the, there is an the opportunity to, to, to apply for such a position. What I'm curious about is how do you encourage women to apply for IT positions? You shared your personal experience that you were sort of told off by one of your teachers and said, no, you need to focus on one or the other. What can we do as society, as organizations, as employers like yourself? What can we do to encourage women to actually apply for these IT positions? So first of all, it starts with the advertising or with the job description. We kind of have to get rid of the ninja rock star developers that we are looking for in our job description because this, for me, if I'm looking at the job description and I want to start in IT, I'm not a ninja. I'm just a girl that wants to uh, perform and to work in a 
environment that respects me and that wants me for me, right? So it's all starting with that. So create a inclusive job description in which women actually can find find themselves, talk more about the culture, about the inclusivity that, uh, I don't know, we have a team formed with, by, uh, we have Mari, who is a technical lead. She's, a, she's been with us in the company for like three years. So we actually are trying to showcase the culture and our people. Um, I don't, I don't um, think we should advertise separately for women and for men. I think we should advertise for professionals. And that's how you uh, empower women that they actually can do any job that a man can do because it's a role, it's a profession uh, you are choosing, not a thing based on your gender. And um, also in recruitment, what we are trying to do, so for example, uh, right before this call, I was looking at some stats in our company. Right now, we have 30% of the total of the company uh, women, right? Uh, this percentage was way much low lower at the beginning of the, the company. And I think through our uh, event in our show our uh, post on social media where you can see girls that actually code uh, in a picture or in a post you you look at this and you see as a young woman that wants a career in this area you think ah, oh, i can i can totally see myself there it's a girl that co it, she's coding right so yeah i think it's like small tweaks in the our communication in the events we are doing Hmm. So also how to communicate this sector. And I think you're mirroring what Cecilia said in the very beginning of, of, the, of the advertisement that there is sort of, we need some role models and it, it needs to be visual. You need to communicate uh, that it's not a man's domain, but it's an open domain for anyone who's interested in, in this subject. Wonderful. Um, Daniela, thank you so much for, for your intervention so far. I think you've given us great insight on, on how you do things, both in, on the personal level, but all, of course also for Victoria Square partners uh, on, on how your HR uh, strategy works. Um, this brings me to our third speaker, who is Joanna. Joanna is the vice president and co-founder at Future Colors. And Joanna is from Poland. And Poland in itself is a country where women for IT has not yet been piloted. But Joanna, your organization, Future Color, has been running a very similar initiative which focused very much on digital skill training. Could you tell us a little bit more about this initiative? Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, uh, maybe I can what we actually focus, we are a company which basically trains people to IT. So we are very much uh, actually doing the boot camps uh, towards uh, various 14 different uh, roads to paths to IT and we believe uh, diversity in IT is something which has to be promoted and also promoted about the jobs so we created a campaign called Woman Update I'm going to show you um, uh, that, that something is not okay well I obviously no, I'm not going to do something went wrong but anyway so the campaign was um, uh, basically regarding uh, working on the stereotype, just as you mentioned, because we know that uh, women still believe that this is done in the world, that's a male world, that it is all about uh, being uh, not in scientific mind, and especially women think they're too old. Because we focus on women who are already in the uh, in the market. Uh, we don't focus on younger girls, but we focus on uh, the workforce of women who are present and the one who at the moment are mostly in danger of the of the COVID and actually of the all the changes had happening in the uh, in the world the digital world which we are witnessing with the automatization with IE uh, so we know that and everyone knows uh, that uh, women are mostly affected not only the COVID but also women affected are mostly by the digitization because they are presently in jobs which are mostly endangered, uh, like accounting, uh, administrative, uh, marketing even. Uh, so if we, we're not going to switch toward the technical side, to technical jobs, they're going to lose out. They're going to be without uh, any, uh, any skills and they will be without any income. So we actually believe that there will be huge initiatives from public sector and private sector to join into this kind of major push women towards 
technical uh, education, quick technical education, because if you are 25 and you have the kids at home, are you taking care of your older mother? Uh, you're not gonna go to university. So actually tier kind of different alternative education, which is very intensive. That's what actually we do because we created our company on, as an online company five years ago, because we believe on the democratization and access to education for all. Uh, so this is the way we think this is the most important to kind of this push. But we know that we have the abilities. We know how to do it. I mean, we, there's boot camps, there's everything, but we know that there still is this huge mental kind of, um, uh, this kind of barrier, which women still think this is not for them. So in our campaign, Women Update, uh, or unfortunately, uh, cannot show you, but I'm going to send you to my website. We created a social awareness campaign. We focus especially on the stereotypes, saying that this is, I'm told, uh, on a stereotype, you need to be a scientific mind to get into IT. And thinking about this is a male world where there's no place for me. So we uh, we work on, on, on the stereotypes with using uh, testimonials of women who actually went through our courses, who already achieved this with consistency constraints and actually they're successful because they're not data scientists, even if they were in marketing, there is software programmers, software programmers or software testers or even scrum masters, which is great for women who are as so who are presently working as the project managers. And we show them what they felt before, all this kind of fears they had before, and how they feel now. So we had the testimonials, we had full of uh, a program of webinars, and podcast with women in IT because we believe, as you mentioned, you can't see what you can't be, what you cannot see. So we want to show as many great professionals, and we had access to companies like uh, banks, uh, IT companies, which provided us with amazing experts. And especially, we want to talk about that they will talk about the professions they do. And we uh, raise about 15 different professionals are. Uh, for women available from Scrum Master to data science to uh, business intelligence is all requiring. And we had free courses, which is actually we developed the small free courses. So women can have the feeling of, you know, what is being UX designer and what is actually first kind of uh, free courses. And that also led to this kind of um, getting them her first kind of feeling of being breaking from the stereotypes and getting access to a small little bit of education. And, uh, and we, this is was campaign with uh, full uh, digital and social media. Uh, so we invested, we invested with our partners about uh, 40,000 euro. And we have reached about 1 million women in Poland. Uh, we provide also guidelines, a guidebook, how to be, uh, how to change your career with, you know, questions to ask, uh, to you ask yourself and where you can get your resources. And this is, was uploaded uh, about 1,000 women brought this. Uh, so this is a campaign which actually talk about the, getting them the first step. So that kind of taking off the stereotypes. And second thing we do in autumn every year, now we did for third year in a row, it's a, like day in IT for women. So we have, uh, again, experts, it's seven hours, campaign, seven hours of workshops and uh, and meetings and summit about how you can change your career, what are the different types of, of jobs you can do. And uh, again, with mentorship, one-to-one, -one, and it's a full day. So again, it's, it's the focusing on women who are already aware that yes, they want to get in IT and pushing them to, you know, getting to these jobs and getting to this education, which leads them to uh, important uh, possibility to be actually present in the market. And uh, we believe, and we believe that we, it's extremely urgent and extremely important because we, as we show all the fa factors, just in Poland, women through COVID lost 40% of the income, 30% of women uh, got uh, lower um, employment. So it was a wake up call for many women that, hey, my jobs are and dangerous. And hey, I see, I can read reports how many IT jobs are open. So this is, uh, we kind of focus on that, on um, telling them the great stories, the great testimonials and giving them access to free tools. And then if they're ready, they can, you know, uh, uh, get to our schools at a future college where they can get formal training and training which lasts from uh, four to uh, 18 weeks. 
and, and we help them uh, to get jobs uh, through our partners who are hiring partners. And so we are uh, happy that at the moment, we also have people, women and male uh, from outplacement programs if they get getting fired from companies. It, that's a result to um, that at the moment uh, we have this year, we train 1000 uh, people to the 14 different paths. 67% of them are women. So, and in, even in the very programming uh, parts like Java programmer, or Python programmer, we have 40% of women. And of course, in parts like UX designer, you have most, almost 90% of women. So uh, this is, we, we believe, important awareness and giving them access to quick learn. And third thing is getting them into jobs very quickly. So open employees should be open to getting uh, internship programs, getting women into mentoring and, and getting them quick as possible to jobs, not waiting that they're gonna be you know, uh, seniors because they need to get quickly learning experience through practice. Great, Joanna. I, I see that your project or your, well, your company, it works in a very similar sort of direction than the Women for IT project. Uh, could you maybe share with us a bit more on how do you work together with employers? So once this, you know, young people or, well, you say it's, it's generally people are uh, trained, how, how do they find a job? Are they left by their own devices or do you have any, any way to facilitate the sort of the training to job market step, which I think is, is a very challenging one for especially young women that maybe don't have the network yet? And so well, we have two, two the approach. First approach is our internal. Uh, once you finish, uh, a course and you become re receive a certificate, which basically is quite intensive and, and quite uh, important because you have to do your own project and you have to present to mentors who, to, uh, who teach you. And then you go into the tap, uh, into support of career support team, which we have uh, in our in-house of two individuals. Uh, one is a one who works with you on your on, on your CV, on your LinkedIn web presentation, because now uh, to you know if if you're being like for example accountant, now now you want to show yourself as a uh, as a for example uh, business intelligence. So you're going to show what is your strengths in terms of well, I'm being analyst for you know 15 years. I know very well on the numbers. I'm very good in the client service because I'm. So all the things you need to your background, and now you have to join that with your new skills that you know the business intelligence, that you know how to analyze, how you how you visualize, uh, for example, all the tech, all the sort of numbers. So we running working on with this person together to make sure that she presents it well, the past experience and the new skills she has, and also the abilities and the the soft skills at the moment that she's you know agile that she's willing to learn and that she's really have bringing bringing to the company a background of uh, of you know years of years a great experience of the market experience and give great client service so once we finish that then we uh, work with our partners we have at the moment 19 19 hiring partners from companies like software houses to BMP Paribas for example Santander Bank which is a huge IT department and we send their CVs uh, and we, you know, we talk to our hiring partners uh, who we have and if they want to be interested in joining them. So that's one part. Second part, we teach them, we give them uh, webinars and we give them one-to-one -one, uh, training where they can uh, apply because there's, you know, lots and lots of different jobs and how to apply. And then third thing is we teach them how to be present themselves during the recruitment sessions. So again, putting forward your very, very strong software that we will develop during your career before, talking about the skills you learned and presenting themselves as the one who's uh, able to learn very quickly because obviously they are very junior, junior in terms of, of, um, of knowledge. And uh, so this is how we turn it. So it's basically three step approach preparation, integration with our partners and showing them how to look for outside. And at the moment, uh, 80, 85% just they, they, uh, they get jobs. Some people get jobs, they already start applying during the event courses and they're very successful. But you know, it's very much on the individual. Uh, and but we believe that everyone can learn, everyone they can change career jobs and everyone get uh, hired. It's very much on the individual. Very encouraging words, and thank you so much, Anna, for, for giving us insight. Um, 
how do you see a potential collaboration with other projects? Now you're of course focusing very much on Poland, but the Women for IT project already piloted in a few countries. How do you see a potential collaboration with Women for IT in particular, but also other initiatives maybe you know beyond the, the national scope? Well, we are this year actually uh, trying to expand. We plan it to be a different market, and we're just doing uh, markets access, uh, understanding uh, where we can go, because uh, our solution can be very well implemented in different countries and uh, if anyone of here uh, attending or this this panels and the session is willing to interesting to collaborate with us to get in a partnership with us uh, to start our business in terms of uh, intensive bootcamps not only for women but for individuals and getting uh, the understanding of, uh, of of huge awareness we have to be provided to you know, break from the stereotypes and break from these constraints and get a uh, woman into IT. So we are very much uh, uh, open to any collaboration and working within different countries, either for women for IT or other, because I think there's so much to do. And, uh, and you know, and the time is, is, is running because it, it, there's more and more demand for IT specialists. And we all know that diversity pays off. So uh, it's great for, uh, for economy, it's great for the woman, and it's great for the project because all the software's uh, products will be better developed if they are you know, done also by women, not only, uh, sorry, only male uh, programmers. So we need that. So this is like win-win situation for all. And I think everyone should be uh, uh, trying to do the, the even small share in every country uh, and contribute and learn from to each other and learn from uh, what has been done because it's, as you already mentioned by Mr. GP, it's all laid down and it's not rocket science, uh, basically uh, help them a little bit, give them a, a finance because, you know, our cost is cost and uh, support them and quickly get into the uh, workforce. Great, thank you so, so much, Joanna, for, for your contribution, for your insights, and also sharing your views. Uh, we're, we're slowly running out of time. There's already a few questions now in the chat window, and I saw that, Evita, I think you, you answered one of them, but you might have just sent them to us as in the panel. So I'm, I'm just going to read it out, and maybe you can just you know, vocally answer to one of the questions that was asked in the chat, which was, how do you find... I have to find the question, how do you find senior mentors uh, for, for young women? Uh, if you have any advice, and I mean, that's a question now addressed to you, Evita, but if the others have an idea, how do you actually, if you want to mentor these young women, how do you find senior members? How do you find these role models that we talked about all day already? Um, so maybe Evita, you could, you could give a start and, and tell us how you think. Uh, um, uh, yeah, thank you. As I wrote, uh, in Latvia we have very active NGOs and one of them, Tech Girls, it's uh, very, very active and, and, uh, and uh, they, are, uh, um, they are open to, to support new women in, in IT and they, uh, they offer the, their staff members as a mentors and, and, yeah, and that works very, very good. And this cooperation with the NGOs, it's, uh, we find uh, that that is very, very good and uh, yeah, proactive and pro productive uh, way how to, how to work. Yeah, yeah, it's a great contribution. The others, I don't know, Daniela or Joanna? Yeah. yeah, actually, we have a lot of women mentors. Uh, they work for us as a practi practitioners, which means they teach. So as a teacher, we call them mentors. Um, but we have, uh, so it's, um, we are very lucky because Poland is a, is a country with full, wonderful, amazing programmers. So we're looking for people who are in IT, but they have this kind of um, uh, want to, to share with the world, want to help in others. So they are, uh, you know, providing a little bit of their time because they have to teach the course, but it's not, they don't have to go anywhere because everything is online. So we uh, basically approach through LinkedIn different people and ask them if they want to share. Of course, it's a paid time, but there's something a little bit more than just, you know, working, but because you're sharing with others and you re receiving from them. So this is one way. Other way we, uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of uh, 
corporate partners and corporation at the moment are very willing to promote their women in, in IT. So it's, uh, uh, and you can actually join and, and ask for the companies uh, if they will be willing to do this kind of volunteering programs for like, like mentorship programs, because uh, if they give, you're giving a visibility to them, um, it's a really amazing both employer branding uh, app, possibility and also communicating uh, of the company with showing again that they have women and showing that they're doing something to the society. So I think it's very approach is going to take cor to big companies which have IT skills because IT teams because they'll be willing to uh, to uh, apply. Uh, there are also mentorship programs uh, done by the corporation like I know we work with uh, JP Morgan with Ben Paribas who have that. Uh, at the moment, we also have companies like there uh, there in IT, which is a it's an initiative where it actually joins you know hundreds of different mentors, women mentors who then work with women who want to join to uh, to jobs and careers. So I think there's already like institutions, or you can do it directly to uh, corporations and ask them if they want to be helpful and you want to join. And I would say most of the companies would say yes. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, especially if they understand also the benefit, as you mentioned, yes, employers branding yeah. and so on. Everyone wants to show as a diverse company yes. and everyone wants to show uh, involvement in any CSR activity. So it's one is it's only thing is that they have some time and lose out some of the time they needed because it's basically a volunteer work, but it's it's feasible. Great. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I'm going to try to squeeze the last question in and I'm going to challenge Daniela to be very concise in her answer. The question was for Daniela. It, there was a question how important it is to for women to complement their formal education with sort of non formal or informal learning, um, especially in the context that it might be demotivating for young women uh, to have this constant pressure of unfair competition in the IT field. All right, I'll try to be concise. So for me, it's, I, I believe it's really important to uh, have extra activity, extra training, because education doesn't keep up with the changes that technology goes through. And if you want to be specialized, for example, as a front end, right, you do four years of school where, or six, if, and then you learn general, uh, and you actually are focusing on a wide area of uh, information. But if you want to get specialized, a six month training on basis in React or technology that are used in front end are really helpful. And regarding the gap between I mean, the difference between women and men, uh, as uh, Joanna said, this mentality is changing. Companies are focused on uh, showcasing diversity and doing getting involved into actually changing the mentality. And I think in this situation to avoid uh, this demotivation, you should do your research and find healthy companies that are promoting healthy environments and where you, where, where you can see yourself being represented. Great, thank you so much for this concise answer, Daniela. All right, unfortunately, we're already coming to wrap for this session. I would have loved to talk with the three of you even a little bit longer, um, but of course we need to also be concise because uh, other people will have to run away at one point. We're coming to our last point, but thank you so much, Evita, Joanna, and Daniela for, for joining us and for sharing your insights with us. It was very enlightening. And now we're coming to the very last part of this uh, event, which is the award ceremony. Um, so I'm happy to give the word to Eva. Uh, Eva, you will be presenting. Eva, you are the director of the European Center for Women in Technology, and you will be presenting this Women for IT Awards. Eva, are you already there? Can you hear us? We cannot see you yet. Let's see if uh, technology works. Ah, yeah, also technology is that. working. We see you. We hear you, Eva. The, yeah, the floor is yours. Good. Please tell us more about the awards. Yeah, thank you so much, Stefan. And uh, I have to say, I am uh, have been very much inspired by uh, the flow of uh, the entire program today. And um, uh, Eva Fabri is my name, and uh, I represent. Uh, uh, European Center for Women and Technology. I have 
we were founded in 2008 and um, I'm director of uh, the center since then. Uh, we are uh, ourselves a multi-stakeholder partner-based organization. So uh, practically the type of projects that uh, we are um, uh, talking about now is really um, the core uh, business for UCWT and uh, our uh, Women for IT partnership was uh, from the start and already uh, before COVID uh, built on three pillars. Uh, one is uh, the fact that only multi-stakeholder partnerships can uh, succeed in bridging the gender gap in tech. The other one that um, training programs need to be based on the real needs of the employers and match with the non-tech uh, job seekers uh, of um, the need target group uh, to a large degree uh, so that they have an opportunity to rapidly and easily develop uh, new digital skills and uh, access um, new job opportunities and last but not least uh, to have uh, also the long-term sustainability uh, aspect uh, in the center that is uh, community building for women in digital and uh, jobs of the future but uh, another element which i think uh, we need to take uh, on board is really uh, sometimes to stop and celebrate and uh, uh, this is how uh, we came up with the idea that uh, our women for it projects would also uh, include an employability award where we want to showcase good examples of the most passionately committed actors, both organizations and individuals who are enabling uh, the training, testing and employment of young women in digital in an innovative way. Uh, for uh, the Women for IT project that uh, we ran uh, since um, uh, 2019 until um, the end of um, January, um, that is uh, formally this year, but as you will hear also beyond that, we have uh, decided to focus uh, our uh, uh, employability award on two categories. One is employers that have taken key responsibility for hiring women trained for the digital jobs of the future and uh, ambassadors, key organizations and individuals uh, who can act as role models, best representing the women for IT model and brand financed by the EIA and Norway grants. So uh, for this uh, first award that uh, we are announcing today in the uh, employers category, uh, 15 awardees have been selected through uh, national nominations. Uh, two awardees, uh, each from uh, Greece, Ireland and Lithuania, and three awardees each from uh, Latvia, uh, Romania and Spain. Um, I would just uh, briefly like to um, mention uh, a few words about uh, all of our awardees in uh, this category. In Greece, uh, the first award is a non-profit organization under uh, the supervision of uh, the Ministry of Culture. Uh, the organization provided career advice to uh, women for IT trainees and internship positions to two of them. And uh, today, both are staff members of the organization. The second employer is a startup in the growth rate, which has provided volunteering and mentoring and support and online training to women business startups. They provide the project management and research support for business plans, funding proposals and specialist market research reports. And uh, linked to compliance uh, specialists. In Ireland, both um, awardees represent the public sector, uh, being a tax authority government body, and uh, the other one, uh, a future in tech program in the national agency dedicated to the promotion of uh, facilitation of workforce learning in Ireland. 
from Lithuania, the selected first award is an organization that collaborated on the development of the roadmaps and the employment toolkit. They have provided guidance and the mentoring and um, they organized virtual tools in their organization and uh, dissemination, the Women for IT project uh, on a national level. The second award from Lithuania is an in innovative educational uh, academy in Vilnius, educating young students in STEM and the organization Talking Girls for Practice and Volunteer Work, as well as employed one of the girls afterwards as a freelancer. The first award of uh, uh, Latvia is passionate to offer equal opportunities and promote uh, women's engagement in tech and the organization has employed six women for IT training graduates and supported all activities of the project. The second Latvian awardee was under the leadership of its HR experts supported young women's employment in the insurance sector through empowerment uh, workshops, experience sharing, and awareness raising for the importance of digital transformation. And the third Latvian award represents the tech side, broadband, uh, internet, safe data transfers, and storage. They have supported Women for IT with participation in empowerment workshops and discussions showcasing to deliver the best in digital future jobs. The Romanian awardees in the employer category have excelled in uh, more unconventional areas. Uh, the first one by hiring a junior web developer graduate into an internship and then uh, hiring the person for a full time job and uh, also uh, providing great collaboration with uh, filming for BBC. The second Romanian awardee uh, provided women for IT trainees the opportunity to access uh, ANC certificates for their trainings and other possible certifications in their future endeavors. And the third employer provided substantial support with finding adequate job profiles in the research phase of the project and uh, organizing a focus group for our for women for IT project. Finally, we have uh, the Spanish employer organizations, which are both global and local innovators. The first one being a new brand that brings together the experience of uh, the world's second largest HR provider and the network of professionals from IT engineering and life sciences. It is a global community for specialists connecting the smartest people and the brightest uh, businesses uh, with the opportunities they need to thrive. The company hired a junior web developer that has been trained in the project. The second Spanish um, employer is a global firm that offers security and protection projects to both individuals and company. This company hired a data analyst trained in the Women for ID project. And the third awardee uh, was founded um, less than 10 years ago in 2013, after the uh, liberalization of uh, the energy market in Spain, uh, with the aim to give uh, greater transparency and uh, new services to consumers, and thereby catching the interest of women in uh, renewable energy solutions. This company has hired a digital media specialist uh, trained through the Women for IT project. So uh, please, uh, Davido now. Yeah, if I, if I can suggest, since we have only a very few minutes left, if I could suggest that we already show both of the videos for the award ceremony back to back. And unfortunately, we will not have the time to go through each of the, the um, uh, each of the awardees for for the second video. But I suggest to the technical team uh, that all the information is being sent to the participants, so that we make sure that all the all the awardees are, of course, uh, receiving the the correct uh, uh, attention that they deserve. So, if I could ask the technical team to now please play both of the videos back to back. Women for IT initiative will not be 
possible without the employers who have supported Women for IT trainees' career development in the piloting countries throughout the project. Today, we want to celebrate those who contributed to our work the most. The Women for IT Awards goes to Heritage and Museums, Greece. Strategon, Greece. Revenue, Ireland. Skillnet, Ireland. Test Dev Lab, Latvia. IF, Latvia. TET, Latvia. UAB BSSIT, Lithuania. Smart Tech Academy, Lithuania. Certi Prime, Romania. Victory Square Partners, Romania. Wipro, Romania. Modis, Spain. Selectra, Spain. Bid Idea, Gestion, SL, Spain. Congratulations and a big thank you to all the awardees for continuously supporting the project. From the very beginning of Women for IT, various organizations and individuals have worked with us towards one mission, to empower and encourage more young women across Europe to start a career in digital. The contributions of these actors have helped make that goal a reality. The Women for IT Awards goes to Women's Union of Greece, Greece. Elma Beeren, Line Up Sports Ireland, Elizabeth Lenihan, Indeed Ireland, Prof Joyce O'Connor, NCI Dublin City, Ireland, State Employment Agency, Latvia, Leah Pyre Tech Girls, Latvia, Riga Tech Girls, Latvia, Lithuanian Women's Lobby Organization, Lithuania Information Technologies Institute Lithuania ANBPR Romania Cognizant Soft Vision Romania Fundación Accenture Spain Indra Spain IBM Spain Congratulations and a big thank you to all the awardees for continuously supporting the project. Okay, thank you so much and uh, warmest congratulations also from uh, ECWP and our Women for IT uh, team to all the awardees. And if I understand this correctly, then uh, actually our Time is up. So yes, uh, unfortunately, I wish we had a little bit more. But thank you so much, Eva, for, for the introduction. And of course, for all the work you've been doing with the awards and with the Women for IT project. I'm going to throw the ball back to Kasha now, who will be giving yeah. a, a small wrap up for the last two or three minutes. Thank you so much, Eva. And Kasha, the floor is yours again. Thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, and thank you to Eva for, for these introductions and um, really running and putting together the awards and making sure that uh, all the stakeholders that have been within the project, uh, they have been properly recognized. And a big, big thank you to uh, really everyone that has contributed to this mission. Uh, these are only some of the stakeholders that really have been pushing our work forward. Uh, but we have had many, many others that were impacting our work at a local, regional, national and the European level. Uh, so we are full, full, full of appreciation to, to these stakeholders. Um, as we're running out of time, I just wanted to say thank you also to all the speakers that we had today. We've seen and we've heard a lot of really great, uh, I think, impactful interventions. Um, and our speakers made very, very you know, interesting and very important points on how we can work together to bridge the gender gap in technology. It's from you know, having systemic um, solutions at the uh, European level, national levels, uh, building successful partnerships, 
uh, in between a public administration and uh, either companies or uh, organizations, projects like Women for IT. Um, it's working with the employers, with companies to make recruitment strategies more inclusive, to make the environment uh, of these workplaces more inclusive for all genders. Um, and it's having, you know, female role models, having uh, women who are already achieved in uh, the tech sector uh, to be out there um, and to share their story, share their accomplishments, uh, to also, you know, inspire a new generation to, of women, um, new generation of women, young women to enter the, um, at the tech industry, but not only young women, because of course for Women for IT, we do focus on young women. Uh, but age is one of the barriers of entering the tech industry. And we also want to focus on the fact that tech is ready for everyone. And it can come together with a higher education, but we also talked about alternative education styles um, and how the entire tech sector should be more inclusive uh, towards this aspect as well. Um, I'm convinced that here today we managed to discuss a couple of points that are super impactful and that we can take all these learnings, get all this inspiration um, all from our speakers, from the experts, but also from the trainees uh, that were talking about their experience in Women for IT, um, and hopefully use these tools, these solutions, these techniques and tips, uh, tips to work together uh, towards bridging the gender gap in technology. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to say is that if you are inspired by Women for IT, if you would want to replicate a project like that, in your own city, region, country, uh, if you'd like to collaborate with us. Um, yet again, you know, there's a lot of solutions available online, um, but you can also reach out to us and stay posted because we will be posting a lot of information on our social media and on our website, um, organizing webinars for you to learn how uh, to cooperate with us better, how to scale your project, uh, how to scale Women for IT as your own project in your country. Uh, so we do encourage you to, you know, stay tuned, uh, keep our social media, um, observe our social media um, and, uh, you know, make sure that you're in touch with us. And if you have any question, you can always reach out to me. Um, I think there will be uh, a contact, some contact information. Yes, Neve posted some contact information to all of us. Uh, if you have any queries, any comments, any uh, also suggestions for how to improve the situation, you can always reach out to us and um, share or try to establish a collaboration and we're very much open to it. Um, so on this note, I will finish today's webinar. Um, and I, again, would like to thank you everyone for both speaking and attending and really showcasing the will to change uh, the situation of women in technology together. So thank you very much. Have a lovely rest of the day uh, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a lovely day.